So I just want to uh, kind of quickly recap what we did in the last class. We looked at so taking a longer window in um, in the past. Started with feedback control. Looked at augmentations of feedback control using uh, feed forward. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. So uh, augmentations of feed forward control. Then um, so using feed forward feedback. Then inverse response compensation, time delay compensation. What else should we do? Inverse response compensation, time delay compensation. Then. We will do something else. We looked at internal model control, which is the basis for uh, both in time delay compensation as well as inverse response compensation. Then we said, okay, internal model control brings in the benefits of feed forward control, it brings in the benefits of feedback control. You can also do uh, explicit uh, change in structure the way you implement controllers. Say let us explicitly bring in the model, can still design continue to use the controller design based on the model, but uh, let us try to keep the model always in the loop when we implement it, implement the control scheme and then see whether we can reap some benefits by keeping the model during the implementation phase. And so that brought out a number of possibilities. For example, in Smith predictor we said the presence of a model it helps because you are going to predict what a future output is going to be at the current time. You are essentially factoring out the delay component from the model, you are looking at the delay free dynamics and you are predicting what the output is going to be. Alpha instance later you are going to predict it now. So if you are going to do uh, use a model for this kind of a prediction then why restrict it only to alpha instance into the future? Why not bring it into the entire philosophy of control which goes back to our engineering definition. Our engineering definition of control is transferring variability from a point where it hurts the most to a point where it hurts the least. So there is a cost associated with the variance in the output, there is a cost associated with the variance in the input. You want to minimize that hurt or the cost. So why not explicitly pose it as an optimization problem that actually says here is the cost associated with variability, here is the cost associated with control, do this in real time. See that the, the what internal model control does is it permits you to do this in real time, you see. I can predict based on the moment of my plant in the past, I can predict how it is going to evolve into the future based on the planned control moves at the current and maybe a future set of moves control plan, I can find out where it can go into the future. So effect of past control efforts, current and future planned control efforts, look at where the process is going to evolve into the future and actually then determine your current control action as a result of an optimization problem rather than a fixed structure black box design like PID having done it once leave it there instead of doing that why not solve whatever is required for example when you design the controllers you did ISE, ITSE, IAE, ITAE why not do that in real time over a horizon okay that is the idea of model predictive control what model predictive control does is says okay you are impressed with the idea of internal model control which explicitly brings a model. You used it for time delay compensation, used it for inverse response compensation in a limited time frame. Why not exploit the model fully, exploit over a horizon, make sure that you use it over a horizon and then evolve suitable control actions via an explicit optimization again. Okay, so that is the whole idea of model predictive control. Okay. To be able to do this, to be able to do model predictive control, what you need is an understanding of how controllers are implemented in practice, okay. About three decades ago controllers were still implemented in analog mode. For example, when you say P, PI control, I is an integrator, integration, integration of a signal which is an error. 
So, there was an op amp or related integrator circuits, analog circuits that were actually implemented in hardware and you would run the PI controller. PID controllers derivatives are realized using analog circuits, not anymore because you know if you have to change a control law using analog circuits, you have to replace the entire circuit. Okay, very unwieldy, large size, slow, all of those problems. So now everything has gone digital. Although the real world has remained analog, our view of that real world process is necessarily discrete or digital in nature. What we have is a computer and a computer is not analog. A computer is, there is a frequency, a real time frequency. Commands are executed at that frequency and sent out. So, there is a finite sampling, if you may call it, or a finite frequency. Somebody beats the drum, which is the internal clock, beats the drum. At that drum beat, some task has to get completed. Okay, so it's a discrete device, and the benefits are: if I have to change a PI control law to a PID control law to a constrained PID controller law, it's just a single line of code that I need to change, and I can implement it without any change in the hardware. And so, digital control is great. We would like to have this. Okay. But all processes, be it the filling of a water in a tank, be it the flight of an aircraft, whatever you do, the real world is still analog. Okay. So, what you need to do when you design, if you design controllers and you have a discrete element and an analog element in the same circuit, for example, if I draw a feedback block diagram, my controller is discrete, my plant is analog. How do I do the design? If controller is analog like we have seen so far, the plant is analog like we have seen so far, we can come up with stability criteria, design criteria, all of that. But if now my controller is discrete, my plant is analog, either I have to do plant representation in the discrete domain or keep the plant in the continuous domain, design the controller in the discrete domain, sorry, in the continuous domain and then discretize that controller. That could be one way of doing it. The other possibility of doing it is treat the plant also as a discrete element and then the controller is a discrete element and then do the entire design in the discrete domain. So, that essentially does away with everything that you have learnt in the course because what you have learnt in this course is analog control. Is it important? Is it waste? Is it a waste of your time for this course? Not necessarily because you can definitely carry over all of the analog that you have learnt in terms of the S domain design and all of that, you can easily transfer it into the discrete domain. Okay. On the other hand, other side, I mean there is a school of thought that says introduce dynamics completely in the discrete domain, introduce design completely in the discrete domain, great thing to do, but then you lose touch of the fact that the plant is analog. Okay. And so, our understanding of the plant is necessarily analog because the plant functioning is analog. So, we would like to make sure that we understand the plant functioning because the moment you start sampling the plant output, you might miss out on the nuances of the world. Depending on what sampling time you choose, you might miss out on the nuances of the plant dynamics. So, understand the plant in its glory, full glory entirety as an analog device, as an analog system, understand its dynamics, then discretize it making sure that all of the nuances that are there in the continuous domain do carry over into the discrete domain, then do the design in the discrete domain and then go ahead with your implementation in the discrete domain. Okay. So, that is one school of thought that says understand control from an analog perspective and then discretize. So, that is what we have been doing traditionally as part of this course. Okay. So, now to be able to realize this uh, model predictive control because model predictive control is necessarily a computer based algorithm. Computer based algorithm necessarily means that the plant must be viewed in a discrete domain. Okay. Not necessarily so, but preferably so. Okay. So, let us now look at very quickly, we will not go into too much of details of, uh, of this. We will essentially look at the discrete domain more from the perspective of how much we need uh, as part of the model predictive control scheme. So, here is what we say here when we implement control schemes, we have the plant which is a continuous time system, it is an analog system. Okay. 
what you view when you have a controller as a discrete device is it receives signals from a continuous plant at a discrete frequency okay so obviously then you have a sampler you have a sampler that essentially connects and disconnects at a particular predetermined frequency and sends that value to the controller right so if i have a continuous output what comes after the sampler is necessarily discrete okay these discrete elements or pieces of information are sent to the controller the controller does a calculation within this time duration which is called the sampling time okay and it sends out a discrete signal because the controller is a discrete device it can't send out a continuous signal it sends out a discrete signal now think about this a controller sends out a signal to a wall to open or close it sends it out in a discrete manner maybe once every second or once every 5 seconds what happens between those 5 seconds so if i have a signal that goes like that the wall will be open in the 5 seconds it will shut again open to a new value shut open so it will start chattering so what you have to do if you have to implement the controller command onto the plant you need to somehow continuous or continuous size if that's a word or reconstruct an analog signal from that discrete signal okay and that is done by an element called as the hold the hold essentially reconstructs a semblance of an analog signal from a discrete signal we'll see what that hold element is all about and then that is implemented on your wall plant and the plant essentially functions in the this analog domain is the idea clear is the idea clear if you go to the lab and look at the controller the controller is a discrete device that's the controller there is a analog to digital converter there is a digital to analog converter the analog to digital converter is this the digital to analog converter is that the hold okay and then so when you do the lab please look for these where are these placed okay there is a adam module in there which actually does this task so ask the ta to open it out for you look into that and say which is the adc which is the dac ask them okay those are there in fact even the adam module that's there in the lab is pretty outdated okay now adc dac is do not look that that big no they are very very miniature and you can do a lot of powerful things with that if you look at that arduino how many of you are familiar with this arduino chip anybody worked with that just out of your interest so if you have seen that you know you can do a lot of things with that in that little chip which has lot of features already built into that okay so this is our view the plant is a continuous system any everything around the plant is discrete since a majority of the elements around the plant is discrete we need to take a discrete view of the continuous plant you had a question okay okay yeah right discrete input ha ha so there is a sampler think of it as something that if you are in physics you know something that opens and closes so it just picks up a spot value and then doesn't connect again keeps doing that why we are putting the sampler the sampler needs to pick up the latest value see if, if i just directly connect it somewhere i need to have the at the computer interface i need to have something that will go and fetch a value the value is waiting there it goes and fetches that value for the computer ha huh, that's what that's what fetching means fetching at some predetermined intervals when you say you want to connect it to the analog again this will be like no 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 this is necessarily a discrete trend that goes to the computer or the controller your question is why do you want to make it no see uh, it's like this there is somebody who is going to process a job only at finite intervals otherwise he is even not going to look at you suppose think of a clerk okay now what what do you do will you just completely keep sending a continuous signal and ask him he must have to pick up the job that's the latest right so to be able to do that there has to be a sampler that picks up the latest right 
it's basic see just explicitly shown it's just an explicit show when I, when I connect something to a RS232 port or uh, USB RS232 port actually if I can send a continuous signal there is a sampler in there that essentially samples only at finite intervals which is the clock frequency of the of the chip correct correct uh, so we will see that in a minute yeah. questions okay so um, let us just quickly see how that is done okay um, I do not want to I do not want to get into this this is essentially describing discrete signals please ignore this because we will not follow this as far as the MPC is concerned there are some things that are important for example how often do you sample if I have a trend how often do I sample okay I sample so that I can get a representation of the signal behavior into the discrete domain okay. So now here is an example an aircraft has two kinds of dynamics one is a high frequency wing flutter and second a slow frequency flap change but as far as my sampler is concerned it is only single so at what frequency would I sample would I sample at the slow frequency would I sample at the high frequency so it is the highest frequency I want to observe in this case the wing flutter if I sample at that frequency I can also observe the slow flap change okay so I will observe at twice the frequency that I would like to observe that is the rough rule of thumb it says sample at a frequency that is at least twice the maximum frequency for processes it is recommended that the sample time must be one fifth to one tenth of the dominant time constant now in say dominant time constant is it the slowest or is it the fastest so if I have two time constants one of, of value 1 and the other of value 100 one fifth to one tenth of time constant which time constant 1 or 100 1 so that is what I would like to observe I will pick up the fastest time constant take one fifth to one tenth of that as my sampling time okay and that is what I would like to implement to get a representation of the discrete signal from the continuous thing okay. The other aspects you can ignore I think it is not part of the course now here is the question that you asked how does a hold create a semblance of a continuous signal from a discrete signal one is very simple hold it at the last value okay that is what it does ut is a continuous time utk is a discrete time at t equal to tk ut will be equal to utk for all values of tk less than t less than tk plus 1 which is the next sampling instant it will still be held at the last known value and at t equal to tk plus 1 it will move to tk plus 1 very simple nothing special about it which means if I have this if I have this as a signal what it will do is it will essentially keep it if you, if you observe my hand okay my hand is too so so if you see this it will hold it at that value jump up hold it at that value jump up hold it at that value so it is better than sending a discrete signal which opens the closes the valve in between sampling instance and then opens it to the new value it is a better approximation than that right so it will be held at the last known value okay that is as simple as a zero order hold now let us see what is what does a first order hold do what can you suggest what do you think first order hold would do engineering sense a simple engineering sense what would a first order hold do a zero order hold does not look at the trend a first order hold will look at the trend so what it will it, what will it do it will look at the slope okay so that is what the first order hold does. very simple the first order hold equation is ut is equal to utk plus no so just ignore this so ut, U, ut is equal to utk at t equal to tk for all times between tk and tk plus 1 u it will be utk plus utk minus utk minus 1 divide oh there is something that is missing here ha, into there has to be a t minus tk also multiplying this okay 
So, u t k minus u t k minus 1 divided by delta t is the slope multiplied by t minus t k. Okay. That is what will happen between sampling instants and at the sampling instant it will be just u t k plus 1. Okay, so, now this is a better approximation than a flat approximation. Let us essentially look at the slope, correct. So, this is what the first order hold. What would the second order hold do? Just look at the second order uh, approximation of that, okay. So, now why does not one go for the highest order approximation? Because cost goes up as, as you implement, as you implement higher and higher order holds the cost goes up. So, most of the times it is just a simple first order hold that is implemented more so from a dynamics perspective also if you choose the sampling time carefully then a first order hold should be generally adequate. Okay. Questions up to this point. So, you have talked about the sampler which essentially determines the sampling frequency. We talked about the hold which is the, the uh, reconstruction of a analog signal from a discrete signal. All right. Now, what we will do is look at the plant. Okay, the continuous time plant. Remember what is the continuous uh, the, the plant? The plant is continuous time, but as far as the controller is concerned, it injects a discrete signal, it expects a discrete signal. That is what the controller views the plant as. It is a controller is a discrete device. So, it injects a discrete signal, it expects a discrete signal. Okay. The question is now will it will this happen at the same time which means if i if the controller injects at u t k will the effect of this be observed on y t k the answer is no because at least one sampling delay will be there because of the hold there is going to be at least one sampling delay perhaps more depending on the time delay in the process but at least one sampling delay will will be there in the process so what you observe as a result of the injected input is at least one sampling instant later as far because of the zero order hold. Okay. So, now generally what they do is they represent the plant from the continuous domain to a discrete domain that says if I inject at any instant i a value u i, I should see its impact on the output discrete output y i or y i plus 1. So, the question is how do I model this from first principles? Okay. So, I start from that continuous time differential equation which I know is true from the physics of the system. right? I know that I can write mass balance, energy balance and I will write a differential equation that looks like that. We know how to write that equation. right? What is the equation we will use? Input plus generation is equal to output plus accumulation. That gives us continuous time descri description. right? Now, what I do? I take the differential term and approximate it in the simplest case back of the envelope calculation. I just calculate it as a finite difference approximation derivative. So, tau y i plus 1 minus y i divided by delta t, delta t will be the sampling time plus y i is k times u i. Okay, this is what I discussed in the tutorial also last time. If I do a little bit of rearrangement, I can rewrite that equation as y i plus 1 is some constant which is a function of sampling time and tau times y i plus some other constant times u i. So, now this follows that if I inject u i into the system, it changes the state of the system from y i to y i plus 1 and so this would be a good a representation of the dynamics in the discrete domain. Okay. Are we jumping here? Everybody comfortable with this with this? Yeah. Huh. So let us go back. So when the controller comes out with a discrete signal, the hold will hold literally hold that value at that last held last value and then inject it into the plant. Because if you see the equation, it says between t k and t k plus 1, the value is held at the last value. 
So when I determine a UTK, okay, if I send it out at t equal to TK between these two values, it is held at that last value. And so the impact of a UTK is felt on the plant at least one sampling instant later, if not more, depending on what else other dynamics are there in the system, what other delays are there in the system. Okay. Okay. So to be able to answer that question, here is uh, so 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 I'll come back to your question in a, in a after we look at uh, approximate discretization, exact discretization. There is something called as a pulse transfer function. Okay. I didn't see this. I'm sorry. Uh, just one minute. Huh. There is something called as a pulse transfer function, and this essentially it says that there is going to be a the hold is described by this element, and this says that there is at, le at least one sampling time delay before which it is transmitted into the plant. Okay, Th that is the result of the hold. Okay. When you model it, that is the result of the hold. Okay. It is actually obvious from this equation also. Uh, see, this is where hand waving becomes a little bit of a problem. Uh, we do not go into the details of this equation, but that is fine. Okay, let us let us even from this equation if you see, okay, even if I discretize it whichever way, if I discretize it as y i minus y i minus 1 divided by delta t, even then I will get an equation that says y i is a function of y i minus 1 and u i minus 1 or even if I do a forward discretization, it will still tell me y i plus 1 is a function of y i and u i. So, any injection of y ui is actually felt on the plant at y i plus or is measured at the plant output at y. See what you are saying is uh, ut at t equal to tk, it is injected into the plant. The question is y is a measured output. It comes, it will come only at the next sampling instant when the sampler closes, right. So, there is at least going to be one delay. Okay. Okay. So, approximate discretization can be carried out by an approximate representation of the derivative. Instead of approximating it like this, if the system is linear, I might as well solve it forward in time using integration and that becomes something called as an exact discretization. You can look at this in the slides, but let us not spend uh, much time on this. I can do an exact discretization and I can still come up with the same equation that says y k plus 1 when I inject okay sorry this has to be again u k or each of this has to be no no that is that is deliberately done this is u t k when I inject u t k it takes the plant from a state of y k to y k plus 1 still the same kind of an equation a difference equation that says if you inject u t k at t equal to t k takes the plant from y k to y k plus 1 okay. So, it will, it will still be the same representation. Let us not worry about the z transforms. The z transforms so just like you apply Laplace transforms to continuous differential equations, you apply something called as a z transforms to the discrete or a difference. This is called as a difference equation. So, I can apply z transforms to a difference equation. Okay. So, S domain and z domain are analogs. S domain is Laplace transforms applied on the continuous time differential equation takes you into the S domain. If I have a difference equation, if I apply z transforms it takes me into the z domain, but we will not go into the z domain as part of this course. Okay. Just ask you to stop here or even better, let us not even get into the exact discretization. I ask you to stop here and accept this as a discrete representation of a continuous time plan. Okay. Okay. I hope everybody is comfortable with that. Yeah. So, yeah. Correct. So you you need to look at it as what does the controller see? The controller does not see uh, the the elements. Controller sees only a signal. So, controller realizes the effect of its command at least one sampling instant later after the sampling. 
So, that is how we should interpret it, right. Okay. Uh, I think all of these are not, uh, I do not intend to cover them as part of this course, but if anybody is interested we can, we can look at it as an as extra set of classes later. So, just wanted to introduce this to bring you on to the same page that model predictive control requires you to predict into the future. What is a good starting point or equation to predict that it is this, this equation. It is this equation that we will begin with. We will say that if the plant is at state y i and if I inject u i, this equation will model where the plant will go one instant into the future. Okay. So, this will be our starting point for model predictive control. All right. So, this is the uh, basics of uh, very, very minimal basics required to understand model predictive control. So, we will move on to the model predictive controller itself and first motivate it. Okay. So, generally when you say PID control, PID controller is a great control algorithm served very well over the last 4 or 5 decades. Okay. In fact, first discovered sometime in the 40s. So, you can even say 6 or 7 decades, but actually got into practice in the late 60s, early 70s. Served very well, still continues to serve well. In fact, PIDs are considered the work horses of the, even if you take a simple, you know, Mars rover or, you know, some of these uh, robots that the uh, mechanical and electrical engineering counterparts of yours build, they are based on PID controllers. Even an aircraft at the fundamental level is a PID controller. They are, they are PID controllers to implement the control scheme. So, it has worked extremely well. Philosophy is very simple. Okay. But as we discussed, we, we need to augment it with a number of additional uh, elements around it to make it more robust and to be able to handle all kinds of uncertainty. So, here is a few of these requirements. Okay. In a general PID controller, the important question that uh, that is asked is who specifies what the set point is. All of the time we have been always working with somebody gives us the set point. The question is who specifies the set point? What do you think? Who's, what should the set point value be? 50 percent of the range, 50 percent for level control problem it should be at 50 percent, should it be at 75 percent, should it be at 25 percent. Who specifies that? There has to be somebody who specifies that, right? And there has to be a systematic way of determining that set point. So, it never occurred to you that you should ask who specifies the set points? What do you think? So, on what basis? Okay. So, now as far as personal comfort is concerned, the user can do it. In a manufacturing facility, depending on how much has to be How much has to be? Like what is the output of What is the required output of the plant? Ah, so, it, it is not so obvious because the PID controller does not determine the output of the plant. The PID controller is not magic, mind you. Can I specify a set point? that is 120 percent of the plant throughput. So, who specifies the set point? In an autopilot for example, when the plane is uh, landing, you know, start down, uh, landing operations are beginning, it is cruising at let us say 10 k and uh, there is a, it requires that it should land in the next 20 minutes. So, there are a number of operations that get initiated. First is the engine gets shut off or slow down, then they gradually lose the altitude, then it does all kinds of funny things. And so, now this complex set of tasks has to be driven by controllers. And so, the controller has to be provided to be provided a set point. The question is who specifies the set points? Is it the pilot? Huh. There can be a 
हाँ सो नाउ वी आर टॉकिंग ऑफ अ सेकेंड लेवल ऑफ कंट्रोलर दैट ड्राइव्स टारगेट्स टू दी फील्ड लेवल कंट्रोलर्स हैव यू सीन दिस बिफोर वेर है कैसकेट कंट्रोल कैसकेट कंट्रोल दर इज एन आउटर लूप कंट्रोलर एंड दर इज एन इनर लूप कंट्रोलर आउटर लूप कंट्रोलर सेस वॉट शुड बी द स्टीम इट स्पेसिफाइज द डिमांड फॉर स्टीम द इनर लेवल कंट्रोलर इंप्लीमेंट्स दैट so the demand is stated as a set point so going to your question throughput what should be the planned throughput okay if i have crude that comes to uh, hpcl vpcl from the port depending on how much crude i have i may decide to operate the plant at 80% or 120% if the plant is can take that or 100% or even 60% depending on the demands and depend because i need to weigh the cost of operating it at 100% and shutting it down and then starting it up versus operating it at 80% over an extended period of time so who makes this demands who makes this decisions there is an upper level advisory or an optimization system that decides what these set points are okay more about this point in a in a while how do you build safety and redundancy in the system i talked to you about the aircraft because it's a classic example there are three levels three levels of functional redundancy which means one sensor fails second takes over second fails third takes over and the aircraft is not allowed to fly if it does not have all three levels of functional redundancy before it takes off because the pilot has to do that rigorous test ensure that complete redundancy is there functional redundancy is there ek सेंसर काम नहीं कर रहा है अरे दूसरा चल जाएगा तीसरा चल जाएगा चलो उड़ते हैं ऐसा नहीं होता है द पायलट हैज टू अथोराइज दैट ऑल लेवल्स ऑफ रिटेंडेंसी आर फुल्ली फंक्शनल बिफोर अ फ्लाइट टेक्स ऑफ ओनली देन इट इज फिट टू टू फ्लाई राइट सो टू बिल्ड सेफ्टी एंड रिटेंडेंसी इन अ सिस्टम इन एनी कंट्रोल सिस्टम इफ यू डोंट वॉन्ट एंड आई एम गेटिंग रियली सीरियस हेयर वी डोंट वॉन्ट अ भोपाल टू हैपन इवन वंस इन ए ट्रिलियन टाइम्स okay due to lack of uh, safe operating procedures or whatever we don't want a bhopal to happen even by chance once in a trillion times i want to build a high level of safety and redundancy in the system you remember why bhopal occurred right why did bhopal occur anybody chemical engineers you should know this why did bhopal occur there was a gas what was the gas methyl acetate why did it leak It was actually a very simple control system, but there was not proper operating procedure followed. Why did it? Why did the gas leak? Pressure build up. Pressure build up doesn't mean a relief valve should open when there is a gas like MIC. The plant should have been shut down immediately, and all containment procedures should have begun. But they treated it like a simple pressure relief problem. Who cares? safety operating procedures did not build in was not built into this i mean this is i mean let's not talk about it okay so you need to build safety and redundancy into the system okay sorry no it's a, it's something that you know as chemical engineers you get very outraged you know it's it's very it's very okay the third question you ask is is the plant operating at its constraints okay typically in a mathematical optimization problem the solution lies at the intersection of constraints okay so you realize your full worth of a capital investment only when you are operating at, it, at at the limits if you are not operating at the limits 80% there has to be proper reasons why so somebody has to make that decision okay is the plant operating at its constraint because this is where the maximum uh, payback is okay are there possibilities for improved performance you always want to check this transferring variability from a point where it hurts you the most to where it hurts you the least we considered centralized versus decentralized yesterday centralized is good because there is one decision maker it's bad because the decision maker is not god you want simplify the control structures through decentralized there is a loss of optimality can you recover that optimality to the best possible extent so should one consider centralized Should one consider decentralized? Should one go for a peer-based 
if the if the size of the problem is large, should one go for a pure based decomposition to simplify? The British did not do this to us. They just cut us up into pieces and they came in 1857. They broke us up, right? It was a complex country to manage. They made one fight against the other and completely broke us up, right? When you do a pure based decomposition, there is literally the peers are entitled or empowered to make decisions in the same way as any other peer. That is a peer to peer decomposition. Okay, and they collectively come up, this is what democracy is all about, they collectively come up with a decision that is acceptable. Okay. In a hierarchical decomposition, sometimes if peers do not agree and they keep on disagreeing, there has to be somebody who is an ultimate authority and that is a hierarchical decomposition. Targets are set by an upper level and cascaded to the lower levels. Okay, so, should one go for this? Okay. All of these are important considerations which need to be looked at from a overall efficiency of the control system, you know, effectiveness of the control system. Okay. So, now here is a simple question. If I have a level control problem, okay, treat this as a plant, there are two actuators. Can you see what are the actuators here? The two valves. Okay. I have an option of either doing a level control by opening the output wall or closing the input wall if the level is higher. If the level is lower, the inverse of these two. Question is how do I decide which one should I do? I can use electrical heating or steam heating to control temperature. Question is which one should I use and who decides this in a dynamic manner? Okay. Would not it be nicer to also incorporate the second element into the first, so safety and redundancy as well as this. Can you tell me a simple way by which I can, safety and redundancy means if one control valve fails, the controller is still able to control the plant. So, can you tell me one way by which I can modify this block diagram to bring in safety and redundancy at the same time have a way of specifying the set point. So, let us just redraw this. Okay. So, let us just redraw this here. Okay. So, this is the okay. I have a line here, I have a wall here, and I have a level controller, a level transmitter. So, this is a level transmitter, and this goes to a level controller. Okay. And now, I could connect it either here or I could connect this here. Okay. What I would prefer to do is have an additional sensor here, a flow controller here. So, this is an instrumentation line a flow controller here, a similar device here, flow controller FC and this flow controller essentially these flow controllers receive a set point from this advisory level. This is an advisory controller. This sends targets as set points either to this level controller or to this flow controller. So, it sends what the target should be to both of this. So, now let us see. Now, the question is what happens if this wall fails or the sensor fails or this wall fails or this feedback control system fails. Do I have a safety and redundancy in the system? Yes, I can move there. Okay. Is there an optimal way I can decide what the target should be here and what should be targets there? Yes, this advisory level 
will actually weigh the options continuously. I mean for all you know this might be electrical heating, this control system might be electrical heating, that might be steam heating and a central advisory system will decide dynamically what is the cost of variation in the output versus the cost of using control inputs and specify appropriate targets to the thyristor controlled heating, electrical heating or the control wall. The flow controller that controls the control will send target saying have this uh, control ste the steam flow to be so much and the electrical heating to be so much because that minimizes the cost. So now it answers two questions who specifies the set points and upper level advisory. Is there safety and redundancy? Yes, because if one fails the second take can take over. Okay. Aircrafts are design was built so that even at the peak point of takeoff, if one wing fails, the pilot can still safely maneuver and land the aircraft. That is the level of redundancy that is built in aircrafts. Okay. Even at the steepest rate of, I said at the peak point when it is still not dis, uh, begun to cruise at level altitude, the pilot can bring the aircraft down safely even if there is a problem. Okay. That is the level of redundancy that is built into the aircraft. Okay. So, we need to ensure that the same levels of redundancy because I might have said this once earlier in the course that why is the life of a personnel sitting in an aircraft more valuable than the life of a personnel working in a manufacturing plant. There is no reason to believe that if aircrafts are designed with that kind of redundancy, why not do the same thing in a manufacturing plant? How do you allow Bhopal to happen? Okay. So, that is something that one has to be very, very careful and build this kind of safety and redundancy into the system. Okay. So, now let us come back to, I mean we are digressing a little bit, let us come back to what we are after in all of this. What, are, what we are after in all of this is an architecture, a control architecture that leverages all our learnings of feedback control, feed forward control, internal model control into a philosophy that enables this. Okay. Answer all of these questions, but I will just show you a couple of those questions. Okay. This is a general uh, hierarchy of how, so you know whatever we learnt up to now in PID control, feedback control is here. This is the plant, this is where we are. Okay. A PID controller decides its control action at a frequency of, at a time scale of seconds, few seconds. Okay. It looks at the error, bang, here is the output, looks at the error, the controller gets an error decides the output. Now, it just does that and does it on a frequency of seconds. Okay. It needs targets, PID controller needs a target which can either be given by the operator or by an optimization layer. You remember I talked about steam versus electrical heating, what is the cost and related things that is done dynamically that comes into what is called as an advanced process control layer. It generates targets for the PID control, it means the set points for the feed. PID controllers. Now, obviously, this also is a layer that needs some targets. Who specifies that? That comes from a steady state optimization, which has looking at a horizon of hours to days. This looks at an horizon of minutes to hours. This looks at an horizon of hours to days, weeks to months. So, it cascades up, and then there is somebody sitting at the top of a, in the refinery office who makes decisions over a period of six months or, or a year. Okay. So, we have that kind of a hierarchy of decision making and what we have studied as part of this course is just this and we are beginning to get into this layer. Okay. There is another student not a TA for this course who is doing essentially integration of scheduling and control. So, scheduling and control, how does one integrate these two? Okay. He is working on that and that is a pretty pretty much challenging, very challenging problem. Okay. So, we will come to that. Uh, maybe some time later, but here is where I want to begin, but maybe I will stop as part of, part of this lecture and then on Thursday we will essentially complete this uh, predictive control and uh, take a quick course summary. Any questions up to this point? Let us stop here.